as we look at the past, I would hope we can get inspired by looking at the craftsmanship and looking at the details and long to build better because we see beautiful things like this. What I want to do with, with each session is spend a little bit of time on, uh, you know, the, the craftsmanship in the building and in the, in the art of building. Um, I, I think it bugs people sometimes when I say we, we've forgotten how to build, um, but I think we've forgotten how to build. And I, I don't mean it uh, in a bad way. I just mean when I look at the way they used to construct and I look at the way houses used to be put together and I see the quality in the design, I go, oh, okay. And as I study the old rules and I study the things, I go, okay, yeah, no, there are a lot of things we've forgotten. And that's what I mean. Now, this is what masonry and brickwork, firing bricks looked like. Let me explain what's going on here. Basically, in the mid-Atlantic, they, they had a ton of clay, right? You would do it when you're big and digging a basement, you just hit clay and all of a sudden you've all you've got is clay. And so clay was basically taken out of the ground, cleaned, because there are sticks and muds and shells and different things in it. They would clean it and then they'd put it into a big you know, bucket and then they would have people step on it. And it was called treading out and they would, they would basically work the, uh, uh, the clay. They put a little bit of water into it and they would work it into like a Play-Doh, okay? Once they got into a Play-Doh, they, they had wood molds. So this is where wood molded bricks come from. <clears throat> they would sand the wood mold and they would throw the mud into the, to the thing and carefully lay the brick out. Let the brick dry for a week, a few weeks, a month, maybe longer. Um, and then when they, when they were, dry and somewhat hard, they would, be, they would begin to make a kiln, okay? Now, realize that th this, is what, this is called a clamp, okay? Now, a clamp is a kiln made at a job site. Now, most of the houses like Carter's Grove or some of these great plantation houses would not have shipped brick, okay? There weren't really brickyards in 1740 you would have built bricks on site. And so you would have find, find a, a, a brick uh, master who could actually build the kiln and actually know how to fire these things. And then you would you know, pull this thing away and you'd make it. Now, you know, think about hauling bricks today in a, in a two by tr in a truck with a trailer and things like that. They had a horse and wagon, right? So you're not hauling bricks, right? You know, down these bumpy roads that aren't paved. So making bricks on site made a lot of sense. Essentially what they do is you see that there's kind of two rows of bricks and there's about a half an inch between each row. And you see this thing that goes out in between? That's what you're looking at here, right? These aren't the, the same thing. And so you would stack these bricks up, right? And then you would build this kind of chamber around. It was open at the top and you would mud the whole thing. And then you would start this fire underneath there and you would slowly raise the temperature inside this clamp and that heat was coming up through here, right? Baking these bricks and things like that. And then for four or five days to get it up to about 2000 degrees, okay? And then about another week or so letting it cool down, okay? Now, <laughs> realize that they had very wildly different results with bricks, okay? They had waste sometimes of 30, 40, 50% of the bricks lost. Now you've heard of clinker bricks and you've heard of different things like that. Basically, because these ovens and these clamps, if you didn't have a good mason, you didn't know what he was doing, um, you would have a lot of waste here. Some bricks were too soft, some bricks were too hard, some bricks became clinkers, right? And so you have this wild variety of different bricks that come out of a kiln that you have to then sort and move around and figure out. Now, there became all kinds of different bonding, pa bonding patterns. And a bonding pattern is, um, uh, you got these different walls, okay? So a bond is where you bond two walls together. So uh, in a 12 inch wall or an eight inch wall, you need to bond, otherwise you're gonna be building these two brick walls that are, that, are, that are just gonna be floating separately. You have to bond those walls together so that the whole thing can lock together, right? And so they have these different bonding patterns that you lay out and you see this American, English, and Flemish. Now in the colonial period, there's only English and Flemish bonds. And you'll see that here, okay? So where's my Flemish bond? Um, see this here? So a Flemish bond is when you, get, when you have a runner and a header, runner, header, and then they alternate, right? So that, so that it, it kind of goes up. It makes a different pattern and a different detail on the brick. 
See this little brick here? Those are glazed headers. And basically, sometimes in the firing, it got so hot, it actually glazed the end of the brick. And that became a feature in the early era where it was very desirable to have these uh, header bricks that were glazed. Uh, an English bond has all these headers going across, and then it has a couple courses and then another header, right? And so, um, where's my English bond? Right, I guess. Uh, can't see it. There's his English bond here, right? So you got all these headers, then runners, then headers. And so there was a magic to how they put these buildings together and how they bonded them. So it wasn't just length, throwing a bunch of bricks up there. They were actually uh, using these patterns, using the different colors to kind of bond their walls together. Now, this is Carter's Grove again. This is where I was telling you this house was earlier. How do you know it was earlier? Because in the 1730s and 40s, this pattern of doing these glazed headers, right, which what you see, you got to see Flemish bond, right, but all the glazed headers was very popular, but when they built this later, they didn't use that system anymore, um, and, and they, they, they changed it, right? The other thing that happens is that there is different ways of striking the mortar, okay? So striking the mortar means because wood molded bricks aren't perfect, okay? It's not until you get into the Victorian era that you have these perfectly shaped and, and uh, perfect squares and perfect bricks. You see fingerprints in these bricks. You see all kinds of different bricks. They're very soft as well. So what they did was they actually had these striking tools, okay, to help make the lines look cleaner and better. And then over here, you see a wood molded brick, and these things are very tight together. We'll talk about wood molded bricks and how they did that, where they would where make these shapes and how their the mortar joints are much tighter on these and why they are. So there's a, there's a magic to these buildings, and as you look at the, the entry at Carter's Grove, that they are essentially building a, a, a you know, beautiful entry here, but it's like a puzzle, all these different pieces put together. Now, the other thing they did is what's called a jack arch. And a, and a brick arch or a jack arch is, remember, this is a solid masonry wall. And if I cut a hole in that masonry wall, all that brick's going to fall down. So what has to happen is, is you're creating a giant wedge in that wall that holds those bricks out. And what's cool is, is that all of these bricks are slightly different, okay, in size, until this one right over the door is straight, and then it shapes the other way, right? So every single one of these bricks is slightly different. And then the way they, they do it, they got two, and then they got four bricks, and two, and four bricks. It creates this wonderful little pattern. The other thing they do is sometimes these mortar joints end up getting, you know, 16th or an eighth of an inch because these are called rubbed bricks. Now, <laughs> rubbed bricks are basically soft bricks that come out of the kiln. They collect into a, a cohesive color and then they actually literally rub them and cut them so that they, the glazed surface is off of them and you see this even pattern, an even color around the opening and so that they would cut these and, and uh, actually hand cut them and or mold them so that they had all these different shapes and how it was put together. Going back to the back side of, of William Buckland's house, the uh, Hammond Harwood house, you see all of these different patterns coming together. You have a rubbed belt course, right? You have jack arch, brick jack arches that are rubbed brick over each opening. You have molded brick. You got a, basically a pilaster here that supports this pediment, but you've got the molded brick at the top. <clears throat> the pattern, you've got a Flemish bond here and you've got an English bond here. The, this magic of the way of putting these buildings together and thinking about the masonry and thinking about how it was not just kind of thrown together. This is where I look back at the past and go, you know, um, the opportunity we have to build great houses today, sometimes we forget, we've forgotten all of the different things that we can do, the bonding and, and just the simple changing in the bonding on a, on a house instead of doing a running bond, changing the bonding to an English or Flemish bond can be magic. And so when you think about the levels of the different things that they were doing, it's even, it's even cooler. Um, probably the best practitioner of traditional building methods is an architect named Quinlan Terry. This is a building that he did in, uh, in, in Williamsburg, Virginia. But you see him playing with the rubbed bricks, the molded bricks. But look, he made a freaking triglyph, right, out of molded bricks, right? He's got dental, right? What in the world, right? In brick, right? Made in these different pieces and parts, all molded together, all made in the traditional method. 
The great story about Quinlan is uh, he did a house in Dallas, and was, I've told this story before, um, but it's a great story. He's building a house, the Muse House in Dallas, which is where the first ICA event was. And he's, uh, Larry Borders is the architect, local architect, and he introduces Terry and, uh, and he's telling this story. He says, you know, when we were building the masonry on the outside of this building, and it's a, it's a limestone masonry, he said, we had to stop because Quinlan got there and they looked at the mortar joints and the mortar joints were three eighths of an inch. He goes, the mortar joints are too big. Now, typically days three eighths to a half is about what you're doing. He goes, they're too big. He goes, what do you mean they're too big? He goes, they've got to be an eighth of an inch. He goes, if we want to make this thing last as long as it's going to last, where it'll last for you know, 250, 300 years, we've got to change these mortar joints, right? So it changed this whole perspective about how you build. Um, his thing was, the architect, said, Larry says, hey, you, you can, uh, um, uh, this house is, is meant to last 250 years without any major maintenance. And Quinlan says, no, 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 that's wrong. It's 450 years, right? So it just changes the way you think about building and everything else. And then, of course, I love this edicule. This edicule here, right? See these, all these, these, this brick arch here? But that actually goes inside, right? So this, this is shaped this way. Curved work is the hardest thing to do with, with uh, woodwork and masonry, but they've got a jack arch here that also slopes inside, right? He's made these, uh, these are limestone obviously, but the, everything else is brick. Notice how tight those mortar joints are, right? It's just <laughs> inspirational, I think.